Shabbat Shalom and welcome to another weekly Bible study as uh, we open God's Word as a workman this morning on the Sabbath uh, to worship and praise God and also read from the Scriptures as we trade the Scriptures with one another. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, YouTubers uh, or anybody on social media or if you are uh, keeping the Shabbat and you're looking online at people that uh, either teach or read from the scripture on the Sabbath, I welcome you to this uh, reading of the word of the Bible study that we're looking at here that we have talked about. I put up several YouTube uh, videos on the subject of uh, the word Karas, uh, G2540, which is uh, in uh, the same or alike as far as the Hebrew word 4150, which is Moed or Moedim, which are seasons or feasts of the Lord. Uh, the seven feasts of the Lord, also the Sabbaths. Uh, these are the Father's holy convocations that he gave to Israel through Moses uh, to uh, follow, celebrate, uh, worship, uh, keep them unchanged in your heart because God does not change. And also, they also include his prophecy people. In other words, the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. And, of course, Christ said all things written in the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning him that he would fulfill. And then he opened their minds to the scriptures. That's Luke 24, 44. Very, very powerful verse there. Right before he ascended to heaven. That's 40 days after the first fruits and the resurrection of the first fruits is when Christ told them this. And so if he opened their minds to those scriptures, then we have to pray and beg that he opens our minds to the scriptures. But we have to be on his calendar, people, and following his ways uh, uh, and be obedient to his uh, Torah or to the feast, to his divine appointments. And then he will give us, uh, he said, you have not because you ask not. He's talking about the Holy Spirit to guide us in to all truth. So well, this is a can continued study of the word karas uh, in the Greek, which matches the word moed in the Hebrew. So I know that, <clears throat> like most of us, uh, that have been raised in past generations, that we are supposedly taught that we are under the New Testament, New Covenant, and that God is now the Old Testament or the Old Testament or the Tanakh or the Torah or the law to the cross. But if you have viewed any of these videos and you're following what the Master said, then they have not been nailed to the cross. All things that offend us, which was our sin, transgression of the law was sin, but now we're birthed of the Spirit, and we are, he has renewed the covenant with us, Jeremiah 31, 31, Hebrews 8, 8, and now he, those that are born of the Spirit, as he told Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit and water, and uh, now he writes his Torah, his laws, up on fleshly tables of the heart. Now he writes these up on our heart. So we're not under the law, people. Uh, but we uh, uh, we are following his Torah. That means instruction. So if you're on his calendar and you're following his feast days and the Sabbath, then, then the Bible says that you will bring forth the fruits in those moeds or those karas times. And when he comes back, remember what he said, who then is a faithful and wise servant when I find him doing so? I brought all of those scriptures out in the last several YouTube uploads of this study. But we're going to look at another 
also continue teaching here. There's going to be, Lord willing, several more because this word is found 86 times, people, in the so-called New Testament. Now, uh, the word Moed is, I believe, I've got that wrote down over here. Yes, the word, the word Moed in the uh, Hebrew text of the Old Testament is found over 300 plus times in the scriptures. So in the renewed covenant of the New Testament is found 86 times. So, and, and we have, like I said, if you, you you're going to understand as we, more and more as we, as the Lord un, reveals by revelation what he is saying to us, which he's, he is very clear and precise in what he's saying. Now, and I think I closed in our last couple of studies in Luke 21, 36, that we are to pray always uh, in every season that we be deemed worthy to escape all the things that's coming up on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, now think about what Christ said, and if you listen to that, any of the last videos, Christ is telling you to petition the Father, that word petition, beg, uh, bind oneself uh, in petition to the Father, and that we would pray to Him today, or beg Him today to find us worthy to escape all these things that are coming upon the earth. Now that's what uh, Christ is saying, because this is the Sabbath. So, for those that have ears to hear and eyes to see, then do what the Lord said. Uh, he's telling us all, we're all members of one body, through one spirit, the spirit of God. And so the spirit of Christ, Christ being the great teacher, the great rabbi, is telling us when to petition uh, that we be fair worthy. Now, I know, see, that completely contradicts uh, walk the, uh, the aisle in, at, at an altar call and say the sinner's prayer and you're saved. Now, do you see what, do you see what Christ is saying? Now, did Christ say? Uh, did he say do that, what they do? No, because, you see, we are quickened by the Holy Spirit. That's why you're born again. So when you're born again, uh, and you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, what you are confessing or professing, that also comes from a word that means in covenant with. So most people, they confess those words, but but there again, uh, when, are, when they bear fruits in the seasons is in the caress times, people. I mean, it's very easy to understand. So uh, this is the meat of the word now. Now, I understand uh, those that might be hearing this has been belonging to a denomination all their life, and they meet on Sunday and Wednesday and uh, different nights, and they go and have big crusades, and they go and preach the gospel to all these countries uh, on certain days and certain weeks and all of that, I understand, people. We've all been raised in that. There again, I was in my 40s before God started revealing the truth to me. So we've all been there. But he's, if you got ears to hear, he's calling you out, and he's telling you when to pray uh, that you be found worthy. He's telling you the seasons that we should be rehearsing, uh, the Moed or the cross times, which are the seven feasts of the Lord plus the Sabbath. So this is what he's saying, people. Now, I'm just, I'm just uh, a vessel that is to blow the trumpet and teach what he says. And so I have no opinions on anything. I have to teach what he says. And, and what he says is like a, his word is like a double-edged sword. All right, now, we're looking in Matthew, the seventh chapter. We're going to start with 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads into life, and few there that find it. Now, if you were, 
All right, let's talk about the few. Okay, few is not many. It's a straight gate. It's a narrow way. Now, uh, you have got most of the Christian world, Protestant, Catholics, uh, do they keep the Sabbath? I'm just going to be as frankly as I can. We've all been there one way or the other in those denominations, and most are still there because uh, uh, they believe that the Old Testament was nailed to the cross. I'm just asking you. Think about it. Now, i seen, I believe it was Hal Lindsey that give a, uh, from where he got his updated statistics, that there were like 1.2 uh, Catholics or Orthodox Christians, and then 800 million Protestants, and some other group, and it come to like 2 billion and 2.3 billion, we're talking so-called Christians. But out of that 2.3 billion Christians or Protestants, uh, are those 2.3 billion, are they following keeping the holy days or the feast days or the cross times or the Moed depending on the Hebrew or the Greek, which words you're using, but they mean the same. And are they keeping the Sabbath? You see. Now, the Bible study we just finished with, people, tells you plainly, Christ says that you be asking the Father during those times. So today's the Sabbath. Now, there again, Christ does not mix his words, people. Now, if this offends some of y'all, then... You know, it's like he said, if you deny my words, I will deny you before the Father. He said, uh, see, we are a, to study God's word as a workman, but the rest of that is, and be not ashamed. Be not offended. See. Uh, but as a workman, rightly divide the word of Yahweh. So if these words offend, that's what he kept, he would ask his apostles or those that he was teaching. He said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Anybody eat of this bread will have you know, in life, you know. So but they they left him. They said his words were too hard to understand and he would say, Have I offended you? Because the word does cut, it does offend in the flesh. But we have to come to obedience to what he says, the master, not what preachers say, people. I mean, you listen to them uh, when most people, when are they going to so-called worship who they think they're going to, going to worship God? When do they do that? They do that on Sunday and Wednesday. Now, according to what Christ said, you will worship on his divine appointed holy days that he created. Now, does that mean that you can't break bread on the other days of the week? Well, of course not. But those are the ones that he, he divinely uh, created for his children uh, to have a meeting with. In other words, these are my divine appointments with my children. Now, I'm going to show up. Now, I want my children to show up. So, now, all the other days are, are chronos times. Christmas is a chronos time. January the 1st is a chronos time. All of the other times of the uh, 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 of man's uh, time here while he's alive are chronos times. Now, he did not say the world for the world is uh, going to do the things they are conformed to the things of the world. But we're to be to conform to the image of Christ. So that means you've got to be separate and come out. So he created the divine times to be separate and come out and to worship him on. Now, you know, I have these I have people that when I'm talking to them about the Saturnalia or Christmas, and uh, we've been raised that Christmas is a religious holiday, and that was when Christ was born. Of course, most preachers know that's not, but, but they can't stand up in their pulpits and now cast the Christmas tree out and the poinsettias and the holly because they know that that's going to offend their people that they're teaching and they and so who's going to pay the note on the big 
multi-million dollar complex that they have all agreed to pay for and to come worship God in. Well, this is just the love of many are waxing colder, worse and worse, is what Christ, this is a mystery of iniquity that had already started in 1950 years ago, people. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, when I talk to these people, and they love Christmas so much, and, and they say, well, I, that's when I worship his birth. So what if he wasn't born on Christmas Day? I, I still worship Christ on Christmas because I love Christmas. Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy and study and see what when he told Israel, and God does not change, the reason he gave to create the holy days is because he had certain days he wanted to be worshipped. And they were rehearsals also of shadows of good things to come, which Christ had to come and die for us and fulfill these things uh, so that we can be changed in a moment, twinkling like, so we can, those that are died in Christ can be raised to eternal life. So this is all part of the good news of the gospel, so we can enter the gospel if we're being obedient to his divine appointments. But what he did also say is, I do not want you worshiping me on other pagan days. See, but man says, uh, no, God, I don't care about that. I'm still going to worship you because I love you. And I know you died for my sins, but I'm going to worship you, worship you on the days I want to worship you on. Now, that is arrogance. That is pride. And that is no obedience. Those are disobedient children. And the wrath is still upon those children, the Bible says. Now, what I say is what Paul says. So we got to repent, come out of that, follow him on his divine holy days, and do exactly what he said. Pray that we be deemed worthy uh, to escape all these things that are coming up. And when do we pray that? In every moed, in every cross time. That's revealed in... Luke 21, 36, people. That's a prophecy scripture. Luke 21 is a chapter of God's prophetic prophecies and about his second coming. And also he says, now who is the wise, who is the faithful and wise servant? When I come to give him meat in the due moed or the due karas divine appointed time, Will I find him doing so? Doing what? Keeping his holy days. Keeping the Sabbath. Worshiping, praising him. Begging that you be deemed worthy to escape all these things. Now that word worthy also comes from Luke 20. Uh, the 20th chapter where it's the first time it's used in scripture. When Christ says those that are deemed worthy. Uh, uh, to obtain in that age the resurrection from the dead will neither marry or give in marriage. So, so being tamed, deemed worthy is also talking about the resurrection, is also talking about being saved, uh, which is part of the kingdom uh, of heaven because it's at hand, but you got to be following him on his calendar, people. Now, that's exactly what he is saying. Now, as we, as we look also in Matthew 7, because straight is the gate, and there is the way, few there that find it unto life, and few there be uh, that find it. Uh, now, there again, if there's 2.3 billion Christians, Protestant Catholics, what do all of them have in common? Even though there's hundreds of, there's thousands and hundreds and thousands of denominations, they worship on Sunday. They they worship the resurrection on Easter. Now you have groups of Hebrew teachers, or converted so-called Protestant Catholics, uh, or different denominations now that are coming to the knowledge of the truth, and they are coming out of that. And they're studying the front of the book. They're studying his holy days. They're keeping the Sabbath. And just like me and most of those, 
we are being attacked by uh, the Protestants because they're saying you are cursing. You're being cursed. You're under. You're going back under the law, and all those people you're teaching, uh, you're a false prophet. Uh, you are uh, a false teacher because you are you are bringing the law. You're going back into legalism. Well, it's God's legalism, people, because He is telling you when He wants to be worshipped. He doesn't change. Now, there's no sacrifice of uh, bulls and goats and any of that. That's been that's already been passed. But see, those holy days are still shadows of good things to come. There's still a resurrection to come. There's still the remnant of Judah that they will have to mourn for the one they pierced 2,000 years ago. When are those eyes going to be open? They're going to be open in the fall feast. See? Now, if if he says, uh, and the prophet says, Zechariah 12, 10, uh, that they will mourn for the one they pierced 2,000 years ago, that has not happened yet. That's going to happen in the seventh month on the ten days of awe there when there is great mourning in Jerusalem. Uh, the tenth day of the seventh month, atonement, is when you afflict your souls, come before Yahweh, and examine yourself as a nation. See? And tabernacles, the seventh feast, the seventh feast of the Lord, the great celebration. Zechariah speaks of 14, 16, chapter 14, verse 16, 17, 18. You tell me when all nations that are left over after these things that are coming to pass upon the earth, which hadn't happened yet, when have they, when have they all nations gone to Jerusalem and uh, that's left over and have kept the Feast of Tabernacles and, and uh, the Messiah has taught them the Torah in his past and his ways? Tell me when that's happened. See, that hadn't happened. But see... What has happened, the mystery of iniquity is crept in and, and was prophesied, and it's greater now than it's ever been. So there again, who are the people, if you're following his Moed, his corrupt times, and you read uh, and you're studying his parables and you see he tells you that you are a faithful and wise servant and he's going to make you ruler over all your goods. That's in the future active voice, people. He's not talking about making you ruler over men under Satan's reign. That's when Satan is bound and Christ sets up his kingdom uh, and he's making us kings and priests. But we're not ruling over uh, nations or cities yet as that's been promised as part of your reward. Maybe you've never been talked at, but all that's in the scripture. Christ is ruling and reigning in us now. We become, he's our king now. Because we are the, no, you're not the, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the temple of Yahweh. But he is preparing you to rule and reign in the millennium. Now, lots of, uh, uh, there is those uh, people that preach predestination or Calvinism or which God's word is predestined. There's no doubt about his sovereignty. But uh, to whom he foreknew, he, uh, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, is Israel. And he did that when he renewed the covenant, and that's why Paul gives you that in Romans 8, 29. But in Romans 11, chapter, Paul tells you, did he cast away the people he foreknew? Who was that he foreknew? was Israel. That's why the covenant is still renewed with the house of Israel and Judah. He didn't change. He just renewed the covenant, sent his son to die for our sins and also the sins that would of the world or those Gentiles that would be grafted into Israel people. See, those, these are the mysteries of the kingdom. Paul tells you us being a wild olive grafted into a natural olive, but we can't boast, we can't be high-minded because it was because of their unbelief, who? The house of Judah, that now God has turned to us to, uh, to birth us of his spirit, and we are to bring in the fruit during our 
Moeds until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That's exactly what this study's about. See, this Greek word, uh, karas times, people, is bringing this whole thing to a light because now the Greek, the New Testament, is confirming those faithful and wise servants are those that are continuing to bring in the fruits during those fixed divine appointments, which is the Sabbath and the Holy Days, or the Feast of the Lord. That's what Christ is saying here. It's undeniable. It's exactly, it's, it's, it just, you've got to know what the Greek word time or season is. See, and that's why we're doing this study. Now, so we'll continue here, and we'll say the next verse in Matthew 7, 15, but beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but in it they are waving, uh, raving wolves. Now, you know, when we talk about false teachers, uh, you look out there and all these false teachers, but you should be able now to discern once you come to the knowledge of what Christ is saying, who are those that are, are, are workers of iniquity, which Christ said, many are going to come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, we cast out devils, done many wondrous works. That's miracles, people. Very many wondrous, great works in your name, in your authority, and we also prophesied. We wrote books of prophecy. We did all of these tapes. We had all of these huge crusades where people come from all over the world, thousands upon thousands of people, to listen uh, to these, uh, what? What Christ, what Christ call them? Raven wolves. Because they, they're workers of iniquity. Iniquity means no law, no Torah people. No feast days. Now there again, uh, uh, a lot of people that's going to listen to this are going to call me a false prophet because I am teaching the Old Testament when I should be converted to the New Testament, and the Old Testament is still what God's got to deal with with the Jews. Really? Well, you, never, you really need to see what Christ is saying here for all you people that might think that, because everything he's talking about is when he returns. So when he returns, have you been teaching or trading or following the Sabbath and his holy days? Have you been teaching on Passover that Christ died for you on the 14th day of Nisan? Not on the 13th, not on the 15th, but on the 14th. Have you been teaching that he had to be put in a tomb right at sundown before dark or if he hung on the tree of the cross during the night that the land would be cursed in Israel? Why did he, why did that, why was that fulfilled that way? Because remember what he said? I come, I come to fulfill all things written in the Torah, the prophets and the Psalms. So it was in the Torah that the man had to be taken down and put in a tomb or the land would be cursed. So that's why they did that. Now you're a witness to that. Why? Because he's king of the Jews, man. He's king of Israel. Yes, he is king of kings and lord of lords. But he come to fulfill the scripture, people, the front of the book. See, all right, now, when he, when he was put in a tomb and unleavened bread starts because there was no sin in Christ, now we also, but following him, now he's revealed all the scripture about not only his resurrection in Matthew 27, 51, 52, but the resurrection of his first fruits, which they'd been rehearsing for 1,200 years, as they uh, wave the barley cakes or the barley cake before him, the unleavened bread, because he got the first fruits. See, well, did he not get the first fruits, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, two years old and under, that Herod killed, that Rachel weeped about, that Jeremiah prophesied, and that Matthew recorded? And then, and then Matthew records that the resurrection, their graves were broke open when Christ died. And three days later, according to scripture on first fruits, he come up out of the tomb, and guess what? The 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, which means first fruits in Leviticus 23.10 actually means the Rashid, 
A Hebrew word means first in time, rank, and order. Christ was the first fruit that was raised from the dead because he is first in rank and order of the creation, the new creation. Guess who was next? John gives you that order in Revelation, the seventh chapter. The 12,000 children from Judah. And then the next in rank and order. Because the first fruits, that's the definition in the Hebrew people. Now the Greek definition is archaea, and that, that is G746. So when you go to uh, the Greek and see any G746, I believe it's 46, I'd have to check that, but you have a like word also in the Greek that matches Rashid and the Hebrew, just like we're doing a word study of Koraz times matches uh, the Moed and the Hebrew people. That's how you can do, and that's how the Bible is the old and the new. You cannot mix, but it confirms it. It, it, it confirms and adds to it without destroying it. See, that's why Paul, that's why Christ said you cannot put the new wine, which is the new covenant that he's made with many, but we are a kind of first fruits. We are not the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth, uh, from man to Elohim and the lamb as first fruits that were redeemed, fully purchased people. We've been given a down payment of purchase through the knife of his blood. Uh, but we have not been redeemed. If we had, we'd already been meeting Christ in the air with glorified bodies. You know, there's a down payment by the Holy Spirit because of belief. But what should we be doing so we'll be deemed worthy to be fully redeemed in the resurrection? We should be following his Shabbats and his holy days. Exactly what he said, which we, this study is about. Now, I know for those that listen to this, this is not, you have never heard this. You hadn't been hearing it, but it, you will start hearing it because God is revealing these things. See, he is revealing his, he is restoring things that's been lost. So these 2.3 million so-called Christians, there again, are they in the straight and narrow way or are, are they in the broad way that leads to destruction. You see, that's what Christ says. There's a broad way, a wide gate, and then there's a straight, uh, uh, enter in at the straight gate or the narrow way. You see, so there again, he's giving you two different things. So, but all I'm trying to show you is Christ says for you to pray that you've been found worthy, and he's telling you, the holy days and the fixed appointed times which God created, which we should be celebrating and keeping, then we petition during that time. See, now, understanding that, did he say petition him on Sunday? On any other day? On, because, see, they are, that's the, uh, that is Kronos time, people. That's not Karas, or that's not his Moed. That's why he don't want to be worshipped on Christmas. Because Christmas is not a divine appointed holy day. And guess what? Easter is not either. So all of these people that are doing that, Christ says, you're workers of iniquity. Your fruit is not bearing fruit. It's not bringing forth the fruit in the seasons or my divine holy appointment. So any other fruit that comes in he calls it rotten fruit, you see. Or you come up through another door and not through the uh, sheep gate door, which is Christ is the only door to the sheep pole. And he calls them all anybody else has come through is all liars and robbers. And what does he say here? The false prophets are, are wolves, you see. Now verse uh, 716 which is our theme verse or our title of this Bible study. 
Ye shall know them by their fruits. Think about that now, people, what we've been studying and those who've been listening to these past videos. Now, what does Christ say? Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? See how, see how he uses his teaching. See, now, grapes and figs represent a certain season in Israel when they were harvested in the fall. See, so there again, what does the fall feast got to do with anything? There's a divine appointments, people. See, so Christ uses this farm or these gathering of, uh, of fruits or thistles or, or thorns, figs. He uses that towards the prophecy of are you bringing in or, or thorns or thistles? Because a grape cannot come from a thorn or a fig cannot come from a thistle people and you say well I know that but if you know that then when are you bring forth the fruits in the moed you got to see what he's saying people because see he created the moon as to record his calendar his seasons his moed his karaz times so if we're following that then those those fruits will come in at those uh, divine appointed times, in other words. Now, there again, uh, we are made alive in Christ when we hear the true gospel of the kingdom. I want to show you that in a minute. There's nowhere in the Bible that you pray a sinner's prayer. But you have all of these evangelists and people that's heard that. There's nowhere in Scripture that Christ says, uh, every head bowed and every eyes closed. Where'd that come from? Come from Billy Graham. See, these are all cliches. But let me ask you another question. And I'm not beating up Mr. Graham. I'm sure he's a fine granddaddy and was a great dad. But that's great in the eyes of the flesh. But was he obedient to, the, to God's word? I'm saying, did Mr. Graham hear what he preached all his life about uh, Jesus Christ and accepting Jesus Christ and coming down to the altar. But, but when did Mr. Graham tell all of those people that come to his crusades, did he ever tell them what Christ said? You pray in every moed, in every divine appointment that you've been found worthy in the resurrection so you escape all these things that come up on the world and stand before the Son of Man. Was that his one of his petitions that you are to petition? And when did he tell you when you should petition that? Because he was blinded, people, because he, 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 he never come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, you, you can stone me for you people that love Billy Graham and his teachings or Mr. Franklin Graham, or all that. They have, they've done many wondrous works. Not, and Christ didn't deny these people that are going to come and say, Lord, Lord, look what we did for you. They have done wonderful, wonderful works now, people. So, so if you want to stall me, I'm going to tell you that they have. But, you know, all of the works of man is, the Bible says, is enmity against God. I mean, it's it don't mean nothing to God. God wants obedience for those that worship Him to worship Him in spirit and truth. The truth, Psalms one nineteen one forty two. For Thy Torah is the truth. His law is the truth, people. Now, uh, now, so I am not uh, judging Mr. Graham. I am, you judge righteous judgment, and what I'm saying was Mr. Graham following what the master who he preached about most of his life. No, he, he did not, and he has not. Could he repent now for all of that and come before uh, uh, the throne and repent? Well, sure he can. 
is, yes, because he's our mediator to forgive us for our sins. But what would that do to everything that's been built on his teaching? Every bit of that would fall exactly what Christ says. How great is the house when it comes, when it falls? That's also in Matthew 7. There's a great house out there, people, that's been built on sand. It's coming down. Now, let me say this to you. I've been to see Mr. Billy Graham three times in my life. And I went to the altar every time uh, that I went as a young man before God ever started dealing with me with his truth. So don't tell me that I don't know who Mr. Graham is because I was there three different times, little when I was small and also when I was in my 30s. So, uh, but Mr. Graham, like all these other preachers, and if I'm ashamed of my master's words, then I'm not going to uh, mark those who walk in offense of the gospel. And that's they are they are in offense of the gospel, and they will be cast in outer darkness. Not because uh, Larry said it, it's because my master said it. And if I'm being conformed to his image, then I speak his words, and his words or the truth. Now, that's what this study is about, and if you go over what I'm talking to you about, uh, and if if I'm interpreting what the Master said here, you've got a place down there to make a comment, and uh, if you can prove by Scripture that I am interpreting it wrong, because this is when he's, he's talking about when he comes back, who will be his faithful and wise servant, bringing forth the fruits during their seasons, which is his appointed holy days. So if, if, if you can show me that's not what he's saying, then leave me a comment and let's discuss it because we're to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, all these pastors, uh, these teachers of the gospel, are they following what their master, what they teach? Uh, are they following these words? Because, see, if they're following Christ, people, they will not ride the pants on Christmas and Easter, which most of them do. They will say, oh, it's not about Christmas. It's about Jesus. What Jesus is it about? Is it the one Hasatan, that, that, that Satan that transformed himself into an angel of light like Jesus, and he's got he's got bukus of minister righteousness that also transformed themselves in apostles of Christ and preached the lie. Now go read what Paul said. You think I'm making that up? Is that some new doctrine? Paul penned that 1,950 years ago, people. He said the mystery of iniquity does already work, and it's all it was already there then. He said, let anybody, angel come from heaven. If he comes preaching another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit, let that angel be accursed, anathema. If Paul was alive today and to see what was going on, uh, he it, it would be, if you think I am saying things uh, out of text, well, you, you need to read Paul's teaching because uh, he used great plainness of speech and I feel that I don't know where I should be much more direct but I am direct and I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat his words because these are words of life for you know the spirit is life these are his words Okay, now as we continue here, I want you to see something uh, in 7.16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of, of uh, from thorns or figs from thistles? Uh, now, do you have an idea now why he used it this way? Well, let's see if this, let's just see if this is what Christ is saying. Okay, if I'm preaching and teaching then I've got, I've got to be preaching and teaching uh, the feast of the Lord. I've got to be preaching and teaching the prophets uh, and also uh, preaching psalms. 
So I've got to be preaching the front of the book along with the back of the book, which we're doing. Because the cross times, uh, Paul kept the feast. The early, the early believers and the Messiah kept the feast. They kept the Sabbath. But you got to understand what happened not long after they were killed, that the mystery of iniquity was creeping in, and it got greater and greater, and it waxed worse and worse. And then by the third century, uh, you know, Christmas was instituted. Catholicism was instituted. Uh, then we see that the Sunday worship started, and anything that had to do with the Jews... Uh, which the Jews kept uh, the feast and the Sabbath, then they was persecuted even more or run out of town because they killed Christ. Now, I don't have all this information with me now, and, I, and if I did, I don't know if I would do a study on it, but I have listened to those that have brought this to light now, which I think is a good thing. But either Martin Luther, Calvin, and I know a lot of these uh, people that preach the sovereignty and predestination, they're not going to like this, but maybe their eyes might be open. But see, Martin Luther hated the Jews. See, Martin Luther uh, didn't keep the feast. He didn't keep the Sabbath. Neither did uh, Charles Spurgeon. None of these reformers kept that. They preached predestination and the uh, doctrines of election and grace which is true but who is it was being conformed it was those that were coming in covenant with god through the messiah to the father which was with the house of israel and the house of judah and to follow the master and on his holy days because that's all, when all things are going to be fulfilled so see satan had them blinded too it don't make any difference how many books and how great a sermons they've had they didn't preach the resurrection of the 144,000. They didn't preach the resurrection of the first fruits. They said nobody knew nothing about that. They had no idea. But the reason they didn't, people, and the reason these people will not touch Matthew 27, 52, 51, Luke uh, 2, 34, uh, Jeremiah 31, 15, 16, 17, uh, Isaiah 26, 19, uh, and all of the teaching Paul uh, Acts 26 to King Gripper 7 and 8 Revelation 7 Revelation 14 uh, Revelation 20 uh, where the scripture is completely full of the resurrection of the first fruits but the reason they can't preach it and the reason they're blinded to it people because they are not on his calendar They've spiritualized his calendar, or they, or they are teaching, you're, we're under the new covenant, and God nailed the Torah and the feast days and the law to the cross. That's the reason that they uh, contradict or dispute the resurrection of the first fruits. Not of Christ, but when do they preach the resurrection of Christ, people? I'm going to ask you these questions, people, because you need to study your Bible. They teach the resurrection on an Easter Sunday, which an Easter Sunday is a pagan holiday, uh, which is Ishtar, the fertility god. Now, this is not something that I come up with, people. Google Ishtar or Easter Sunday. Do some research. And then say, why man, my pastor told me this? Why, why have we been celebrating Easter for the, all these hundreds of years and Jesus Christ was born, I mean, excuse me, was resurrected on the third day according to scriptures, according to Leviticus 23, he was resurrected on first fruits, people. So if I'm going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I've got to celebrate it on first fruits, exactly what when he was raised from the dead. See? But why haven't we been told this, people? Because Satan deceives the whole inhabitant of the world. It's the light of the true gospel. 
It's another gospel. That's the other gospel. If you're worshiping on a Easter pagan Sunday, then you're not on his calendar. But see, Easter is not when Christ was resurrected. That's a lie. Christmas is a lie. Now, if you go to the Revelation in the 20th chapter, you're going to see that all liars, which means a falsehood, are going to be cast into the lake of fire, people. I didn't say it. Your scripture says it. But, you know, what saints are, Larry? I mean, nobody's ever, well, repent. Well, the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Study your book. You don't have to walk an aisle. If, if you confess Christ as your Savior, you have been, you have come in covenant with Christ to the Father. That's the new covenant. Confess means in covenant also with people. When you confess his words, you're confessing what we're studying right now. I'm confessing his words. You see, I'm confessing that he said to bring forth the fruits during his uh, cross or fixed appointed times. This is the Sabbath. We're having a worship, a study on the Sabbath, which he's revealing these things. You see, so that's what you that's what you got to do. Repent and come out of that. I mean, he is telling you here. Uh, can a grape, is, does grapes come from thorns? No, there's a certain time that grapes are harvested. <coughs> That's why he says, you will know them by their fruits. Are you understanding the revelation of what he's just said? Are they teaching on the Shabbat? Are the, are the ones you're listening to, are they... Uh, teaching the holy days, are they celebrating, are they keeping them unchanged in their heart, are they saying they've been nailed to the cross? Well, all those that teach that they've been nailed to the cross, they're thorns and thistles, people. That's what he, that's how he's using that. That's how he's using this uh, parable. You will know them by their fruits. You see, you say, oh, me, Larry, that's, this, is, uh, this is unbelievable. This is hard to... I just, are you sure? Well, what is Christ saying? See, go back and listen to some of these videos uh, and then just open your Bible and if you've got a King James that gives the strong number or if you've got a King James that doesn't, you're going to have to go a little bit further uh, to, and, and see what I'm showing you here. Because you're supposed to be rightly dividing God work, God's words of work, but you're supposed to be studying. Now, studying doesn't mean you read. Uh, studying means you read that you get a concordance or you get a, uh, a lexicon, or because the Bible was wrote in Greek. You see. Now, let me read you this, and I'm not going to read the Greek words. I don't want to know how to speak Greek, people. I study the Greek and the tenses because. Uh, I need to be doing that. But as far as becoming a Greek scholar and saying Greek and walking around or, or even uh, Hebrew, we need to know certain things. But Christ will, he will, that pure language will come when he comes. Uh, but yes, we should know what the Hebrew word moed is. That's why we've been given uh, these concordances and, uh, and the numbers and the definitions. Well, sure, you should be doing that. Every time you study, so you can not be taking something out of context or understand what it meant uh, back then. In other words, uh, we we're, our language is English, but it's transliterated from the Greek to English. There's no perfect translation. You can't translate Greek into English. Uh, you know, it, the Greek is too uh, advanced there. Okay, now. But we can go glean the truth now. I mean, in English, of course, the translations, but you've got to do some studying. There again, uh, when you see uh, uh, in the King James in Luke 21, 36, uh, in every season, 
That's the translation from the Greek. The word season is his divine appointments. So it's not spring, winter, summer, and fall. The only way you'll know that is that you've got to know what the definition of karas or the definition of moed in the Hebrew, and it means God's fixed divine appointments. And when did he create them? In Genesis 1.14. So if he created them in Genesis 1.14, he hadn't uncreated them. So, and he didn't nail them to the cross because the moon's still shining. Because he created the moon to uh, record his holy days, his Sabbaths. See, that's what the moon uh, he created for. See, he did not create it for for Americans to go to the moon and drive a flag in it and walk around on it. And now, did they do that or not? I'm not sure they did. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Doesn't mean anything to me. What it means to me is the moon is still going through its conjunction and it's uh, waning and waxing and it was still recording his Passover his holy days and everything so uh, that's very important because uh, we need to be on his calendar like he said when I come back will I find anybody will I find that uh, faithful and wise servant bringing forth the fruits during their season see so let's look and see what the Greek says here uh I'm looking, I'll look at the, the uh, West God Hort in the Greek, Matthew 7, 16. <clears throat> it says, from the fruits, uh, now it also gives a gender here, which is the fruits here. Uh, it says uh, the fruit there looks singular, but in the Greek it's plural. It's used in a genitive plural masculine. Uh, I... And this word, uh, 1921 in the Greek, uh, is to know, well, you, you know, from the fruits, uh, you will know them from their fruits. Well, know here is actually in the future uh, dative indicative. So, in other words, when Christ was speaking this, he says you will know them, but he was speaking here in the uh, in the future, because the Holy Spirit hadn't been sent yet. The Holy Spirit will guide and lead you into all truths. So the Greek is so precise here because it also gives a, uh, a past, present, or an aorist tense, a future tense, a present tense, a perfect tense, and it also gives uh, the genders. And that's in the second plural having to do with fruits uh, in the genitive plural. Now, I know people, I've lost a lot of people here, but I'm just, I'm reading it to you how it's stated there. So, uh, you will know them, the fruits, uh, and it says, uh, you, that word know is epigenosis. It says, you will know. Will be a doubt, because see, if you're on his calendar, you're going to know other people that are teaching the same way. Now, everything might not line up exactly to what people are teaching as far as in the the hebrew going back to the hebrew roots or going back to the feast but they're all doing it during that season see and you will know so i can go on the internet and i can see who is who is teaching the shabbat and the holy days or rehearsing or bringing forth uh, uh these treasures out of old and new because see i'm in the new bringing treasures out of the old See, that's what he said. You bring treasures out of the new, renewed covenant or out of the old. They have to uh, complement each other, people. That's what he meant when he's doing all these parables. The kingdom of heaven is like this. When you bring treasures out of the new, renewed covenant and the old. See, exactly what we're doing. Okay, uh, trying to see how much time I've got. I'm almost out of time here. Uh, so... So he's talking about, you will know them about, so do they bring, uh, are grapes brought from thorns or figs from thistles? See, of course not, see. So th this is the interpretation to the Greek. Of course, you learn a little bit more because uh, when Christ spoke this parable, uh, but he, that's why he had to go away so he could send the Holy Spirit so the renewed covenant could start 
And Peter could st stand up and those that were following him that were endowed with the Holy Spirit from on high could start uh, the new creation by preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. But if you notice there again, everything pre uh, Peter preached, he went back to the Torah and the Psalms and they were convicted because the resurrection is in the Torah and the Psalms. Uh,